video quality. Uh, it looks like a mid-1970s Richard Donner film. I'm filming this on my phone, uh, but hopefully the sound's okay. <laughs> my phone's not too much in my beard. Um, this is part three of my talk with uh, Sean Rourke. Uh, if you want to see the first two parts, uh, they're episodes eight and ten of Make a Thing. And uh, it's a long interview, so we've broken up into these parts. And I really needed to thank Sean for that because uh, after we recorded, he was like, oh, you should space that out and, you know, put it out in little chunks because at some point you're going to have too much regular work to do uh, in a given week and you won't have time to get a thing together to put up an episode. Um, and uh, you'll be able to ease back knowing that you can just put one of these up there. And uh, you are exactly right, Sean, and this is that week. Uh, and I'm incredibly thankful to you. You can thank Sean by going to his website, thevampirescastle.com, uh, or going to his YouTube channel, uh, also called The Vampire's Castle, which, uh, no spoilers, this dude loves vampires, like loves vampire fiction, loves vampire movies, loves talking about vampires, interviews people that write vampire stuff, uh, makes vampire movies of his own, and uh, most importantly, he really is an inspiring force that gets you revved up to make your own stuff, and uh, um, uh, which has had a strong effect on me, uh, and I can't help but say that I've been thinking about vampire ideas ever since we spoke, so maybe I'll cook something up myself. Anyway, uh, uh, go check that out, and uh, I hope you dig this interview. Uh, this interview, I talk a little bit about my mom, and I just want to say, wherever you are uh, out in space, mom, thank you for uh, making sure that I was the nerd I was born to be. Anyway, I'll see you after the thing. Okay, so so we've talked about your 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 method for directing and and actually making the thing. Mm -hmm. um, it is my armchair observation, uh, and this may or may not actually be true, but this is just what I have observed of the kinds of material that you like to work with, is that uh, you obviously have a love of science fiction mm -hmm. and genre, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, a, in addition to an extensive knowledge of film history and theory and, and, and just story in general, but, but you, you really seem to come alive with science fiction. Mm. And specifically, I feel like the, the kind of story that you love to tell is uh, a very close human story about regular people having to deal with very regular things mm -hmm. while on the horizon is a giant Dyson sphere. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> exactly. and so like, and so, so if you could just, just talk to us for a few minutes about, you know, sort of what, what is that, that happy place for you where, the, the, the story that you really want to tell, what, what do you think that is, if you could distill that? I think, uh, let's see, this reaches, this reaches back to my uh, childhood a little bit. It's the, um, that, I, I think, you know, um, I was, I was a pretty weird kid. <laughs> like I was pretty weird. What? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and uh, my and my mom, um, she was a like she was a super intellectual, extremely smart, very deeply read person, um, and uh, and so she set me on. You know, so she sort of saw where my brain was going on stuff. And she started like plugging me into some pretty weirdo sci-fi very early on. Dune was actually one of the first, like when I was like 10 or 11 years oh, old. Great. And, um, and before long, it was, you know, you know, like just all sorts of, you know, like all sorts of stuff. And we like, you know, from uh, like Greg Egan and, uh, um, you know, Stanislaw Lem and, uh, you know, some like, and uh, Ray Bradbury and all that other stuff as well um but uh <clears throat> and this is you know i'm not i don't 
I don't do, I, I, I tend to steer away from like deep personal dives on things, but like, I think it's the, the way to think about it. It's like, my mom was a very, like, absolutely, absolutely loved her. She was an amazing person, but she was also very sort of like, you know, um, she wasn't a very uh, emotive person or like, mm. the, like she was, you know, she was very sort of, uh, you know, sort of clear headed and you know, mathematical about stuff and very sort of, you know, serious about uh, how to approach things and uh <clears throat> and so she wasn't uh the best at expressing she wasn't like lavish with her emotions i guess is the way it said but i discovered uh like i was like my whole child was like sharing sci-fi books with my mom and all that stuff i discovered just a little while ago just when, when uh, probably like a, you know 10 10 12 years ago um it was, it was actually you know it was it was a, no it must have been 10 years ago or so it was after she after she passed away and i uh and uh my brother said oh yeah she hates science fiction yeah. she just she started she just knew that you liked it so she read a shitload of it so she could talk to you and i was like <laughs> you know oh and my I th- god <laughs> and really? I was just like, <laughs> yeah and i'm just like this was really it was really wild to make this realization of just like this is how she expressed her care for me and her love of, her love of me was just like i need to find a way to communicate with this weird kid you know i love him and i need to find some common ground that we can i, I like reading and he likes i don't know star wars <laughs> so let's figure this out um and so like i think that i've always associated science fiction in particular uh like it's it's less a like i obviously love all the novel stuff about it like all the spaceships and sciencey bits and cool cool things um but it's always struck me as a as a very it connects to me in a in a in a personal way that i never really understood until i learned that uh because that was the that was the way in which uh this channel of feeling was being given to me and now when i think about like the stories that i write are always you know it's just like this is all it's it's all it's all wrapped up in that same kind of feeling for me where it isn't the the novelty it's the person like it's the person who's experiencing this this, yeah it's a bizarre world sure you know but like the most interesting thing is the is the person we're looking at you know like and more often than not like they're having you know know, almost all my stories like it's about people that have difficulty communicating you know and just like um, you know they were they they want to find a way to convey some important feeling or thought but you know something's in the way of doing that and so after i found that out i was like oh now like the 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 curtain's drawn and now you can see how the machine works inside my head (laughs) oh okay uh you know and so and so like it's the uh i think it gave me um a way to like uh a a way to talk about uh feelings which were enormous feelings and the and the enormity and power of those feelings uh it's difficult to just represent them in a story um uh how can I say it? Like literally, like mm. uh, when something is, and this is what I really love about movies is like, um, is you can like, as movies are not. This is gonna. I'm sorry, it's hard to focus down, but like movies are not real; they're dreams, right? And uh, they may feel really literal at any given moment, you know. And movies can be made in the style of realism, you know, just like oh, it felt so, in you know factual and you know an actual um but they're always actually melodrama and sort of condensations of emotion uh in in the guise of something else you know and so uh when you have fantasy or you have science fiction like the grandiosity and power of actual real life emotions is best represented by things that aren't describably real like mm. they like they're best represented by something that's dreamlike and crazy because that's how real love actually feels you know like you're you the love you have for someone 
is not something you can that is conveyed to other people by saying, I love this person. Like they understand right. that, right? right? Um, if you're going to show them a picture of what that love is, it's going to be a fucking exploding spaceship. <laughs> like that makes sense. <laughs> you know, it's going to be something completely otherworldly because that's what it, that actually feels like. Because there's no way to actually say it. You know, there's no way to paint a picture of it. You just need to get people in this other state of mind. And so like, and that's why things like melodrama, like melodrama gets a bad rap now, but like, like uh, melodrama is, uh, you know, it's like a silence of lambs is a melodrama, right? It's where things are, are very, very, very heightened in, um, in unrealistic ways, but emotionally true ways, you know? And, uh, and so you have like, um, whatever Clar Clarice is, you know, Clary says uh, issues with her, the death of her dad and all this other stuff she has to overcome and doesn't trust herself and all this kind of stuff. Like you can sit down and have an in-treatment episode about that and it would be very interesting, you know, and the, sure. and the acting can be sure. very solid and, and very evocative. Um, but uh, my, the, like, it's not that I don't like that stuff, but uh, that's not going to get everybody. Like that's mm -hmm. going to get, that's going to get people that are into that particular framing of emotion um which by the way is also fictional like that's not real either that's not how real therapy works <laughs> you know <laughs> like this is actually dressed up and it's totally an illusory as well it's just done in a right, way that makes right. you feel comfortable in letting your emotions go you know and uh so when melodrama is done really well it's it's broad and it's it's soap opera -y, i guess is the way to look at it because everybody understands it like it makes people unselfconscious enough to lift that emotion up out of them right and then when you do things like say like dune blew me away like the movie blew me away i loved it and uh and it allowed the way the, the way that this movie worked allowed villeneuve to do things on a grand scale for millions of people that he wouldn't have been able to do um, if he had made it much smaller, like mm. uh, because he he brings people in with this sort of phantasmagorical, you know, setting and these crazy images and this unbelievably you know rich mood and spooky stuff that's happening, and all of that um, romances you and disarms you. And then he tells these very small emotional beats all over the place, you know, and those are the things that add up. Like the actual story is the looks between Paul and his mom. Like that's the actual movie you're watching, right? And it's put in this giant, ridiculous backdrop. And so you're swept away and you don't feel like you don't feel self-conscious about anything. You're just like, look at the fucking sandworm, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and he's sneaking in these these little windows into actual like um, actual emotions that you can, that you have on a day to day basis, and uh, and and setting up little filmmaking techniques that because he's talking about like whatever the spice or the uh, you know the, uh, the the visions that Paul has, like he like that's presented in a science fictional way, but what he's really talking about is. Um, like you have a choice in every moment of your life and there's a million different things you can do. And that is uh, freeing and terrifying. Like, and that's true whether or not there are spaceships, you know? Right. And so like the, um, the science fiction, uh, like I was lucky to have the mom that I had uh, to sort of open that in my brain early on. Um, but it's also just like, it became the, the, uh, the easiest channel, the most unselfconscious channel to, to plug into those real emotions. And, uh, uh, because it just sort of frames it in a way that everyone, like everybody who experiences it, like nobody's going to feel guarded. Like they are all on board because it's beautiful looking you know, or that's a cool idea or whatever it is. Right. And, uh, and then, and then slowly all that stuff, all the big stuff sort of falls away. You know, it's like when we were making spoiler, it's just like you get, you know, there's less and less 
zombie mechanics as the as the movie goes along very true and it's just about this dude talking to this dude and then you're on and closes on that and all the all the stuff that brought you in the door is outside of the frame and uh and i think that the that sci-fi just like it, whatever works for people it can be it could be you know um uh, magical realism it could be you know uh you know, um, uh, whatever things set in 1600 France, whatever it is, like, like whatever, whatever sort of like gets you through the door, like embrace that, embrace that thing. Um, for me, it's sci-fi for sure. And I think that sci-fi is unique in that it can share in all those things. Like if you're making a French period drama, like you're going to get the French period drama crew. They're going to be watching that thing. And that's what it's going to be. <laughs> right? Yes. But right. Sci- sci-fi can be like, yeah, it's sci-fi, but it's got a little bit of this crazy frocks you love, you know, <laughs> we'll bring this on board, you know, and so it's a little bit roomier and you can get people into, uh, into uh, both an intellectual and an emotional space um, that we can all share uh, a lot faster without, you know, um, uh, either getting too sort of removed or specific or without being too sort of ironic and judgmental about things you can just be like this fucking rocks worms 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 suddenly i'm sad about paul and his dad and what you're really paying for is that and so that that's what that's what has always connected rung for me all right there you go uh people should know by now that even if no one asks me about them i'm going to wedge into the conversation somehow anyway um but I hope you get a kick out of that. And uh, uh, though it was a super uh, crunchy work week, uh, still stuff got done, and uh, West pushed through getting um, uh, God Save the Queen uh, into the actual podcast of Sphere. Uh, so you can now get that on any of the regular channels that you get your podcast from. Uh, episode one is out there. We have a lot of really bizarre ideas going into this podcast, and uh, uh, and uh, and sort of strange interviews coming up. Um, and it gives you a good idea of like where we're going to be taking the story. So uh, check that out. Uh, write in the comments what you think about that, and I'll see you next week as we make more things to make more things. Make